It's page 14 in the Blue Bible. Title this message, Check Your Posture. Check your posture. The main text is going to be Genesis 17, 15 through 27 today. Genesis 17, 15 through 27. People of God hear the holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I've blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. We had finished talking with him. God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael's son and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. In all the men of his house, those born in the house, and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Let's pray and ask God for his much-needed help. Oh, great God, almighty God, our Lord, our Savior, we pray for your help here. Holy Spirit, open up our eyes and our ears to see and hear what you have here. Lord, drive it into our hearts, theirs and mine, this passage and what you want us to take from it today. May you get glory for it all. Help me. In Jesus' name, amen. So how does a Christian really do the Christian life? You ever thought about that? I mean, how do you live each and every day for Christ? How do we do the seemingly impossible things that God often in our lives calls us to or believe those seemingly impossible things that he calls us to believe? How do you do this day in, day out for as many years that God may give you? Because it's a hard road. It's a narrow way. It's a difficult path that he calls us to. This isn't a news flash. You guys know this. As I look out across the congregation, I see many people who have had difficult lives, tough upbringings, who are going through tragedy right now in tough times. You're scared. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're suffering in other ways. How do we do it? How do we get through this? Well, today's text can and will, by the grace of God, answer all of those questions. It will help us as we look at Abraham, who was faced with a very difficult situation. God is calling him to believe the impossible. And not only that, but in light of that, to obey God, to obey him, and do extremely difficult things, a very hard and difficult thing that would tempt any of us to say, you know what? I can't do it. I don't have the strength. It's too hard. I just can't. 
And often in our lives, we are faced with similar situations. Although very different from Abraham's situation today, very similar in the fact that we face tough things, difficult things, things that are hard to believe and to do in this Christian life. And as we look at how Abraham did it, how he believed the impossible, how he worked through and did difficult things in light of all he was going through, we can see how we can do it as well and believe as well. No matter the task, no matter what you and I are up against, we can do it in everything, in anything we run up against. So get your eyes open, your ears ready to hear what God has to say today. We're going to break this down by looking at it like this. Promise, reassurance, and obedience. Promise, reassurance, obedience. Let's start with promise. Look at me starting there in verse 15. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall call her name Sarah." Or you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. So we see this kind of tension, this struggle being framed up here, and it's framed with God bringing back to light this impossible promise once again. Simple as that. Sarai, who cannot have children... He's going to have children. He's going to have a child. It's impossible. But God is going to work his power and work a miracle in her and through her to accomplish this. And then God kind of confirms this or gives kind of a sign of it by, by changing her name from Sarai to Sarah. Now, it's interesting. Sarai with the I at the end means my princess. Eli, I at the end, my, and El, God, my God, but prince, my princess, and then Sarah means just princess. Seems very subtle, but he changes it. There is some substance there. So what is it? Well, you could say in a way that, that Sarai was, was Abraham's princess, so to speak. It, that name had kind of an internal focus towards it, in to the family, my princess, my family. There's that inward focus here, dropping the my, and although her family will still be very important, but the focus is going out from the family now. Through this child that she is going to have, Sarah will have, will come kings, which princesses have, right? It's gonna come nations. It's gonna ultimately come the Messiah, Jesus Christ, through those descendants, through Sarah. So not only did God change Abram's name to Abraham, now he changes Sarai's name to Sarah. God is going to do big, incredible things through this family. They are very important in history. It's a lot to take in for Abraham. How's he, how's he going to react to all this? Well, look with me there in verses 17 and 18. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Interesting. We see Abraham falls down on his face and laughs. What are we seeing here? Faith? Doesn't look like it does. It looks more like doubt or unbelief, but not so fast. You see, when you get to the New Testament, Paul speaks into this situation, illuminates it more of what was really going on in Abraham's, Abraham's heart in Romans 4, 18 through 21. Listen to these words. Paul talking about Abraham in this situation says this. In hope, he, that is Abraham, believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. Seems as he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as, as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And I looked at that and said, what? 
Paul says Abraham was fully convinced. He believed. He had a strong faith and trust that God was going to bring about his promise. And I look here in Genesis 17 and see him falling down and laughing. I'm going, what's going on here? Some will say this was a laugh of joy. And I think that's part of it. But might he have had strong faith, trust in God here to bring this about, and yet at the same time been having an internal struggle to some degree where maybe his faith was being pushed to its limits at the same time. I mean, have you ever had your faith pushed to the limits? It's there, it's strong, but it's, it's being tested, being pushed. I mean, I can remember driving in my car one time and meditating on this. Lord Jesus, you paid for my sins. We get so used to hearing that, right? And we should hear it often, but we get so used to hearing it, we lose the awe of that. And it just struck me, driving in my car, the awe of it. You paid for my sins, a sinner who for 23 years was your enemy. And you not only paid for my sins, but you let your own creation crucify you. They didn't just take your life, you gave up your life for me. 2,000 years or so before I was ever born, that you love me, a sinner, and not just a sinner, but a great wicked sinner. And it just struck me as his love just hit me. I just remember thinking, how can this all be true? I knew it was true. I knew it was 100% true, and yet it was just an amazement. Just laugh. It's almost unbelievable, and yet I believe Praise God. Sometimes your faith can be there and be strong and yet being tested, being pushed to its limits. And I think that might be what we're seeing here with Abraham today in light of what Paul says about it as well. He's trusting God. He's believing God and yet struggling a little faith being tested, pushed. He's just in amazement and awe at what he's hearing. But what does God do with someone like that? Sometimes us. What does God do with someone who's believing and yet may be struggling, who is trusting and yet needs some help? Well, he often brings us reassurance. He often brings us reassurance. Starting there in verse 19, look with me for reassurance. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So God reassures him again that the promise is going to come through Sarah, the promised child. His name's going to be Isaac. The impossible is going to happen. A miracle is going to be worked by God. Now, God is bringing clarity on this. He never said it as explicitly as Sarah, but didn't Abraham know this? I mean, think about what God told Abraham in Genesis 13, 16. He said, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted about what God told Abraham in Genesis 15, 5. Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God had told Abraham multiple times, I'm going to give you offspring. I'm going to give you a child. And Abraham probably could have put two and two together. I have a wife, Sarah. God's going to promise to give me offspring. It's impossible. But God means Sarah is going to have and bear my child. And then we get to what? Genesis chapter 16, where they try to, Abraham and, and Hagar and, and Sarah try to help God out. And he goes into his servant girl, Hagar, and that debacle and that mess and bring out Ishmael, trying to help God out. Time has passed. Maybe God needs a little assistance. And as we've been working through Genesis, we have seen reoccurring themes, if you haven't noticed. And I'm sure you guys have. There's that faith, there's, there's struggle, there's doubt, these reoccurring themes that keep coming up. 
We've seen Abraham who, who is believing at times and other times is unbelieving it seems. At least in what God has said, we see at times that he is just a rock hard, strong man of faith and other times he seems like a wishy-washy sand dune or bar that just washes away with the wind and the water. And I wonder if you've wondered what I've been wondering at times. Why does God keep bringing this up? Why does he keep reminding Abraham, I'm going to give you a child? He keeps telling him that. This continual reminder. You know why he does it? Because Abraham needs to hear it time and time again. He needs reassured. And we often do as well, don't we? We hear things, but we need reassured of them time and time again. I remember years ago when I was really sick with my thyroid disease and the endocrinologist comes into the room and you guys have heard some of this story before, some of you, maybe some of you haven't, but he comes into the, into the room and he, he says, you really got one of three things that can happen. One, we're just going to let the thyroid destroy itself, which it's currently doing. And once it does that, it'll be dead. And then we get put you on thyroid medicine the rest of your life. Option one. Option two, while we do that and monitor it, it may go too high, the levels, and you don't make it. You stroke out and die. And I say, okay, option two's out. And three, we play it safe and we cut it out, your thyroid, and we put you on the medicine as a safe way. What do you want to do? Oh, well, let me think here real quick. I was like, oh my, this is, these are not good options. So I said, I need time. Let's just monitor it for now. I need to pray. I need to think about this. Uh, I just was struck with it. After that, Ashley told me what I needed to do graciously and lovingly. Is she pointed out what James says, what God says in James 5, 14 through 15. It says this, is anyone among you sick? Oh, I'm qualified there. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. But we're in a reformed circle. We don't do crazy things like that, like obey the Bible, do we? No, we cast that away. That doesn't happen anymore. We're too sophisticated for that kind of stuff. So after struggling with doubt and unbelief by looking at brothers and what they say about this passage, who I love and agree with much of what they said, I finally agreed. It's right there. So we called for the elders and other people in the church and they agreed. They prayed over me, they anointed me with oil, they put their hands on me, kind of freaking me out a little bit, you know. And guess what? God healed me that night. You don't believe in miracles, a walking testament too. I went back to the doctor's office, that endocrinologist. He walks in expecting the same results as he, I got the blood test, he looks at the T4 and the TH, uh, TSH levels and he looks at it and he's just perplexed. Because your, your, your thyroid is, is, is it's normalizing. It's in the normal level. He told me there's no way. It will never normalize. It will die. There is no heal. There is no way. There's no treatment. There's nothing for this. You're doomed, basically. This is your life. But I knew what had happened. But I was perplexed too. It was one of those, <laughs> no way. That was eight to 10 years ago. I haven't been on thyroid medicine. I have had multiple blood tests that confirm time and time again that it is normal, that it is healed when it was unhealable, untreatable. But every time for many years, I'd go back to get that blood test, I'd struggle, doubt would creep in with me. There'd be that internal struggle. I knew I was healed, but what if I was wrong? What if I am kooky? What if I am crazy? What if God doesn't do miracles today like some will say? And God would see my doubt. He would see my struggle. And in his grace and his mercy and his patience with me would continue to reassure me time and time, year after year, with confirmed blood test after blood test, healed, healed, healed. So often we can be like I was and so often am, so stubborn to believe God. So stubborn. And struggle with trusting in him. Even when he heals in a miraculous way and confirms it. And says it clear cut in his word. And 
And we need reassurance. And today he does that with Abraham, although I don't think Abraham was struggling quite like I was. He clarifies the promise with Abraham and then he gives him reassurance, doesn't he? He brings it back up. Abraham knew what God had been telling him this whole time. It would be Sarah. She would have a child, but he needed to hear it time and time again, as sometimes over time he would doubt and struggle. He needed reassurance. So I got to ask you, do you ever need reassured of anything? Do you need reassured of anything today in your life with what God tells you? Maybe you need to be reassured today that God loves you, right? You look around your life, you look around your circumstances, the hard things God has called you and taken you through in the past that you're in maybe right this very second. You've seen in the past what he, what he allowed to happen to Paul and Peter being martyred for the faith. People who have followed him with everything they have and they're killed. They're crucified upside down. They are, their heads cut off. You, you look at Christians around you suffering. You look at people who have had their kids taken from them off this earth. You look around and your loved ones are gone before you would say their time. And you look around at all of that and sometimes it can creep in. Does God really love me? Sometimes we need to be reassured of that. I do sometimes. This past year, I surely have. Well, let's let him reassure us right now, shall we? Listen to what he says and how much he loves his children in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, where Paul says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He doesn't just say love. He says with his great love for us. Not enough about what Jesus said in John 16, 27. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came from God. And how about 1 John 4, 10? We could go all day, but one more. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, to pay for our sins as a sacrifice. You see it? You can see it in the text. You can see it all around you. God's love for his children. But you know where he has most explicitly displayed that? Those verses even pointed to it, all of them. And Jesus Christ is where we see that the most, right? And Jesus Christ taking dead sinners like us on our way to hell and not even realizing it and grabbing us and giving us new life, opening up our eyes to see the gloriousness of the cross, that it's not foolishness to us anymore, that he really did die for us and rise again, that we really are forgiven in him when we trust in him. Him, seeing him on that rescue mission to this earth for us. That perfect life we could never live. That death sacrificially given for us. Bearing the wrath of God that we should bear in hell forever. Poured out on him at Calvary so we would never have to taste a drop of it. And in the seal of the deal, rising from the dead. Showing it worked. He was victorious, defeating sin and death for us. That's love. That's grace. And sometimes we need to be reassured that God loves us. And when you do, as you should never take your eyes off of this, but sometimes we do, you look back to Calvary. You look back to the cross at Christ and what he did there. Sometimes we need reassured of things. And there's this text today, Abraham was reassured that God was with him, even that God loved him, and that God would do the impossible and bring him a child through Sarah. And, and this reassurance and dwelling on what God said was really what drove Abraham to obedience. As we get to our last point here, Abraham believed God, and as a result of that, 
he did and obeyed God in an extremely difficult and hard thing to do. Look at me there starting in verse 22 for obedience. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Ouch. And Ishmael, his son, I added the ouch. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house, those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Now, this is a pretty incredible uh, event here, if you think about it. Think of the logistics of this. I mean, Abraham obeyed God immediately. He didn't wait. He didn't put it off. I mean, it says it right there. He circumcised him, verses 23 and 26, that very day. And it wouldn't have been easy to do if you think about it. You see that there? By this time, there was likely three to 400, maybe more males in his household that needed circumcised. Genesis 14, when, when Abraham went to rescue Lot, it says that there were 318 trained men of war. Those weren't even the male children at that point, 318. This was many years prior that went out to rescue Lot. So there's likely probably over 400, but conservatively three to 400 that needed circumcised this day, all of them. Piece of cake, right? Minor surgery. No, there weren't medical instruments like we have today. Modern techniques. They needed to be cut in the flesh of their foreskin. It's going to be bloody. It was going to be painful. It was going to be difficult. And think about Abraham himself, who God's telling this. He was almost 100 years old. His body is frail and he's going to be circumcised. Oh, this was huge. What I'm trying to lay out is this was a big deal. This was a big and hard thing to do. Oh, okay, let's just get that done. Oh, it would have, oh. And then Abraham obeyed. He obeyed the very same day. And I think that's a point right there in itself. The very same day. Is there anything that you've been putting off, that I've been putting off, that God has made crystal clear that you need to do this. I think this is going to strike some people with this. And I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even thinking of anyone specifically this. But I don't know why. This is going to strike us. Because if you're anything like me, you like to procrastinate on things, right? Is there anything in your life that you've been putting off? Maybe it's, oh, I know God wants me to do this or that. Or you see it circumstantially in providence in your life. Or just clear from the word or whatever it may be, but you're just putting off. It's too hard. It's, it's too difficult, but, 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 but. No. You need to obey him now. Today, what's going through your mind? He sees it. We gotta quit putting things off. But you might say, okay, but how? Or maybe there's nothing you've been putting off that you can think of, but maybe in the future when you, you realize, say, how do you do it? How do you do such a hard and difficult task? Well, we look at how did Abraham do it? He struggled immensely at times as we've been working up through Genesis. He doubted at times. He struggled in the faith at times. Other times rock solid. So how did a weak, struggling sinner like us do such a difficult and monumental task of circumcising so many people and believing that God would do the impossible. Well, I think it comes down to posture. How was his posture before God? Well, it says he was on his face. Same chapter, beginning of the chapter, look at verses 1 through 3, Genesis 17. It says this, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, or Abram, and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Oh, okay. 
Okay, that's easy. Then I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And how does he respond to it? Look at the very next words. Then Abram fell on his face. Blameless. Blameless? God tells him, be blameless and walk before me. Blameless? Abraham had seen his failures. Genesis 12, fleeing to Egypt without consulting God. Genesis 16, the debacle with Hagar, trying to help the Almighty out. He needed a hand. He's seen it. He's seen what his heart would do. Blameless? That's impossible. So what does he do? He falls on his face before God. What about today when he's reminded of the promise that God was going to do the impossible through Sarah giving her a child? Not only that, but he's looking at he's going to circumcise himself and all these people, the pain and the difficulty of all of that. What does he do? Genesis 17 verse 17 tells us. Then Abraham fell on his face. You see, it's all about posture. How do we serve God and stand firm in God and do what God calls us to do in the face of adversity in our lives, in the midst of anything? How do we obey God and believe God for the impossible? Posture, not just external posture, but internal posture. As Abraham was on his face before God, it shows his internal heart posture towards God, in awe of God and his majesty, completely and wholly relying on God, humbling himself before God. God, I can't do it. You are God, I am a man. You've seen what I've done. You are perfect. I cannot be blameless. I cannot do these things in my own strength. I need you. I believe, help my unbelief. I am weak. I need your strength. What about Jesus' posture in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 39? I was thinking about this point the other night. And this is crazy. I wanted, this wasn't even in my sermon. I was thinking about this point. And my wife's reading the Spurgeon devotional morning by morning. And she has it there on the nightstand. Everyone's gone to bed and I'm, I'm sitting there praying, reading the word, thinking about this. And I look at that devotional there and I have not been reading it lately, that one in particular. And I just feel like God's saying, pick that up. I pick it up and in March 22nd opens up and I know it's not good to just pull out the Bible and put your finger and say, this is a life verse. I don't mean that, but it just came up and it was this verse, March 22nd. It just came open. And in this, Jesus is looking to the cross right in front of him, the, the hardest and the most difficult thing ever to be done. That's what he is thinking about and praying about and looking toward. God in the flesh, the Son of God, is going to bear the wrath for an innumerable amount of sinners. And here's what the text says he did. Matthew 26, 39. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, as strong as he, all powerful, fell on his face before God, the father. I have to ask you, gut check time. How is your posture before God? Are you on your face daily before God? Are you standing up straight and proud in your own strength? Are you in awe of God? Or are you really in awe of yourself and full of yourself? Are you depending wholly on God or in yourself? Are you wholly on God or in other things or other people? How is your posture before God? Because this life is too much to take by ourselves. We cannot handle it by ourselves. If every gift, good gift is from God, if every breath that we have is from God, every heartbeat is from God, we can do nothing apart from God and his strength. And we need to understand that and realize that. And the more we understand that and realize that, we will position ourselves on our face before God as we walk through this life. Our hearts always humbly before him, ready 
for God to give us the grace to carry on, to do and believe whatever he says. As James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud. You don't want to be opposed by God, you'll lose. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who position themselves on their face before God Almighty, ready to receive his grace to carry on. And I really think that is the key for Abraham here today. To believe these impossible things he is believing and to do these very difficult things he is doing. And that's the key for you and me today as well. Nothing has changed. And that goes for any situation throughout all of your life. It is huge. It is huge. And then we can say with Paul, as he did in Colossians 1.29, he said this, For this I toil, meaning Paul toils, struggling with all his energy, God's energy, that he, that is God, powerfully works within me. Energy and focus and strength. The as for you as we looked at last week. Yet God giving us the strength and power to do it all. Therefore, he gets all the glory. So as we leave this place today, how is your posture before God? Mine wasn't very good. I love that when you're preparing a sermon and God drills you. It happens every week. And praise God for it. So if you think I'm drilling you, I've already been annihilated. Are you on your face before him? Is, is your heart really relying on him wholly and humbly? If not, repent. His arms are wide open and he will take you and he will use you and he will give you all the strength, all the grace you could ever need in abundance to wholly trust him in everything, to wholly follow him no matter what the cost, no matter what the task. And if you've never known him, you need to trust in him. You need to fall on your face before him and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to bow the knee to Christ and believe. For all who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. His life lived for you, his death given on your behalf, and his resurrection to give you new life. Believe. Brothers, sisters, friends, fall on your face before your God. Let's pray. God, as always, we need your strength to do just that. Lord, we draw near to you now and pray and ask for that enablement, that help. Lord, we repent of our sin before you, of our pride before you. Lord, we bow before you, give you praise and ask for your help to do whatever you are calling us to and to believe your word full stop. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with me and sing 32, great is thy faithfulness when you have it, 32.